Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Fantasy Romance and Romantic Fantasy. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Hmm, that's good. I have my typewriter mug this morning. Uh, today is Thursday, August 29th. Uh, someone gave me this typewriter mug which is seems like a thing that you would give a writer except that I do not share the uh, the typewriter love that some seem to share. I don't get the typewriter love um, especially for oh, get out the sun's glare there this kind of typewriter if you're on video this is the um, the old fashioned kind um, where you would like have to hit the uh what was it called the cartridge you know you have to manually return it which actually for you young whippersnappers out there is where return on the keyboard comes is comes from because you would actually the cartridge on those old typewriters would move all the way over actually I would go this way right because you go type 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 and it would move and you would have to return it to its initial position and it would gradually roll up using um you know a new line of ink every time if you never typed on one of those old manual typewriters they were hard I mean you had to really have serious finger strength you had to punch those keys um and I think I've told you guys but uh my otherwise darling and insightful and lovely friend Grace Draven uh <laughs> she has her quirks people and one of them is that she loves the manual typewriter thing and she had even gotten a keyboard for a while that she got from some sort of kickstarter deal that was an old fashioned typewriter keyboard that she could use on her computer and we would be talking and she would be taking notes and she would be that thing was so fucking loud. <laughs> And I like couldn't hear myself think I would be like would you stop <laughs> and she's like and, and she would just cackle you know if you guys know her you've you've heard that cackle she goes <laughs> she'd be so pleased with herself but glory be the thing broke shocking right that's one of the things we've discovered with the whole kickstarter thing it seems like a great idea but it turns out that product testing is actually a thing and <laughs> <laughs> that when you don't have it uh, that can be a problem. So um, I promised to answer a few questions today do a little bit follow up on my talk Tuesday. It was interesting um, that it really seemed to strike a chord with so many people uh, including people who are not writers um, maybe even especially people who aren't writers because I think I got more comments and feedback that uh, people were really thinking about it and my nephew Brett um, an engineer uh, wrote me a long essay on YouTube uh, which I found absolutely charming um, you know and why did that provoke so much thought and some of it is is that question of success which I do think bears revisiting and some of you pointed out you know is why do we have this idea that more is better and you know and I have heard it explicitly stated by the by the success gurus you know that they always say uh, if you're not growing you're dying that just comes from nature people that's what they'll say that's my success guru voice that just comes from nature that's how the universe works well it's not true right um <laughs> yes growth and death are part of a cycle but uh, there there is also a maturation phase and there is also in nature homeostasis right. In fact a great deal of nature is based on homeostasis that you find a certain point where uh, it is say an ideal body temperature or um, an ideal predator prey population and nature moves towards balancing those things. Yes there's some 
fluctuations as you go up and down you know like your body's thermostat works essentially like your house thermostat does that it once you drop down to a certain amount your body kicks up the metabolism to warm yourself up once you get too hot it slows the metabolism cool you down again um, and then being intelligent creatures we do all sorts of things to maintain it but so do animals right um, and if you studied any ecology you learn all sorts of animal behaviors that they do to um, help help maintain body temperature you that's why you will often see you know like dogs pant we we know that's why dogs pant because it's cooling let <laughs> you emit a lot of hot moist air from your mouth um, birds will sit with an open beak if they're hot again exhaling that hot air that hot core air so you get a little nature lesson again today we won't talk about thigmotropism but we will talk about uh, homeostasis so you know that's that's one thing about the people who um and, and I had a teacher like that once who was like I don't make the rules I just explain them but he would pick the rules that fit what he wanted to be true what he wanted what his point was and that's the same with if you're not growing you're dying so so yeah that's a fine question why why do you want to grow do you want to grow just because you feel like you should be growing and and yes that's certainly a core part of our relentless um, American consumerism which I understand has uh, bled out to many other parts of the world as well that you know what's um more 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 right because that that feeds the the companies that want us to buy things from them if we don't want more we uh, we aren't um, spending our money right you're already happy with the stuff you have as my uh, religious studies advisor in college told me that if Christians really believed in what Jesus said at the Sermon on the Mount there would be no shopping malls we don't actually believe in all that Yeah, uh, worship that al almighty dollar and and you could see that in the you know the built-in obsolescence of, of so many of our goods these days that you know especially the electronics that they are you know like I've had my um my VG 30 V30 LG V30 phone for it's not even that many years since 2018 three years I think it was 2018 fall of 2018 and so I've paid it off which is nice and Verizon is losing their fucking minds that I will not get a new phone they call me and and talk to me about new phones and I I've gotten so I won't answer the phone if they call anymore and you know it's like you know the first time I answered because I thought it actually might be important <laughs> but um you know if they they really want me to buy a new phone and my phone works fine thanks so anyway it's it's worth examining is there a reason that we want more all the time especially uh, for people as they get older are often scaling down it's like I don't want such a big house I don't want to have to maintain so much shit <laughs> so you know, and you become aware of that with somebody cleaning your house like I have somebody cleaning my house now and I was looking for my most favored red Starbucks holiday mug and it was um way at the back of the top shelf which is why I ended up with the typewriter mug which came out of must have been in back but you know the ladies they go through and they clean and it's great that they actually wipe out my cabinets but then everything gets rearranged <laughs> but that's what happens when I mean we have far more coffee mugs than two people need but they these things they accumulate right so to answer a few questions about the publishing industry though because Brett asked some questions um, and put forth some uh, hypotheses I suppose or a premise one is that he was operating on the premises that a good book will sell well which has a certain internal logic 
Uh, and it's also based on an idea of a certain level of fairness in the world, I think, that we want to believe that good quality will always rise to the top. And I remember something that uh, my friend Kevin, first love high school boyfriend Kevin, said to me when I complained about Harry Potter because I'd read the first Harry Potter book and I said um, that I didn't get the magic, that I thought that it was, first of all, hugely derivative of many other books that I'd read, that it used very familiar tropes and that uh, I didn't see any reason for it to be so wildly popular. And he said, well, you mean as opposed to other things that become wildly popular in our consumer culture? And it was like, well, well, that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, just because trying to find a spot out of the sun dappling. I'm running late today. A nice cool morning I slept in. Oops. One thing about waking up on your own calendar is you become very aware of how your body rhythms change with the season, seasons. And there's an autumnal feel in the air. And I definitely had that uh, wanting to stay snuggled into bed this morning. Feeling, and I did snuggle just a little too long. Okay, let's find this. Ah, there we go. No, we're not going to be entirely successful, but I'll have to attempt not to move. So it would be nice if good books sell well. And those of you who have been listening to my podcast for a long time know that one of my least favorite pieces of advice is when some very successful author will be asked, you know, like, how do you get published? And they'll say, well, first of all, you have to write a really good book. Um, this is my least favorite advice. It makes me want to set my hair on fire because it, well, it's worthless advice. It's completely worthless. First of all, it assumes that you know how to write a good book. It also assumes that there is some sort of quantitative or qualitative measure of what a good book is. And then it assumes that a good book will automatically sell well. And none of these things are true. Uh, there are plenty of really good books that have only ever found a very, very small audience for whatever reason. And I'm sure we can all mention that, you know, occasionally there will be a Twitter thread on you know, name one of your favorite books that you feel like more people should know about. And inevitably you'll get someone in there who'll like recommend a Sarah J Moss book, you know, and they'll get shouted down because it's like you fucking idiot. <laughs> because more people don't need to know about Sarah J Moss's books. Not that she doesn't write great books, but I was talking with a friend of mine the other day, an author friend who sells much better than I do. And she's looking to sell more and better, and I'll explain why. But she was saying that she had read um, Sarah J. Moss and Jennifer L. Armentrout, and she said, I, I don't think that either one of them is a better writer than I am. She said, well, maybe, I can't remember, she said, maybe Sarah J. Moss was a somewhat better writer than she is. And I said, no, she's not. I've read you both. And you're, I said, in many ways, you're a better writer because uh, my friend is, is much tighter in some ways on plotting. Um, but she's admittedly not as popular as Sarah J. Moss, you know, and, and she was telling me that her agent had looked up and she's like, do you know, did you know that Sarah J. Moss has sold like 36 million books? And I was like, I knew it was a lot, um, you know, and, and go her, you know, that's, that's amazing, but it's not because she's a better writer than my friend. Uh, it's not because she writes better books than my friend does. I, now, arguably, um, a number of my friend's books, I think, are better books. But there's a certain magic that Sarah J. Moss tapped into that galvanized people. You know, and another example of this is Fifty Shades of Grey, which is a book I liked fine. I mean, I enjoyed it. I, I also read it before there was a lot of hype. I've told you guys this before. But... Um, you know, I thought it was fun for what it was. But there are many, many people who can point out legitimate major craft errors in the writing of Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, and they'll argue that that makes it a bad book. But again, I think there's no 
it's subjective. There's no qualitative or quantitative measure. You could say, well, yeah, these things are not considered to be a good craft, but you can't call it a bad book because it also has sold hugely, you know, and E.L. James is worth $80 million or something like that. And it's not because she wrote a better book. So logical fallacy there. Uh, what lights people up? Who knows? Why was Harry Potter, you know, the book of a generation? Just was, you know? And so much of this is right thing at the right time. Uh, tapping into the cultural zeitgeist, uh, whatever. <clears throat> but the reason my author friend is worried about this and why authors worry about this is so like, for instance, and I'm trying to talk about this without giving too many personal details on her, but she has had, um, a very successful, she's had a couple of very, very successful series and her last series was successful enough that they doubled her advance on this most recent series, which is awesome. And you know, like doubling her advance is like quadrupling anything I've ever gotten. So I, I don't, I'm not, I don't know if she's ever told me her numbers, but you know, like I know that her scale is very different than my scale. And so that's great. But the problem is, is that an advance is exactly that. It's an advance against royalties. So the publisher is saying, we think your books will earn this much money. So because her other series earned this much money, the publisher was like, well, we'll give you twice as much as, a, as an advance because we believe you'll earn that out. And the early sales on this book are not looking like they will. She's worried she's not going to earn out and you don't have to pay that money back. Not unless you don't write the books, but it also means that. So for example, um, Orca Throne, which came out in fall of 2019 has earned out its advance now, but it just earned out its advance. Um, well, just this month I got a check from the publisher for my share of the royalties and I get a percentage of every copy sold a small percentage, but I get a small percentage of every copy sold. And so now I'm actually getting what I think of as the gravy money because now it's, it's earned out its advance. And so now that book just generates money. And that's the great thing about books is that it will continue to generate money for the rest of its life, but it'll probably gradually decline over its lifetime. I mean, they generally do unless you like get an HBO miniseries or something like that, something that really kicks up the sales. But, so now what my friend is facing is because the sales aren't as good as the publisher thought that now she's talking about her next book deal because everything's working in advance. Right. And they're, they're not liking any of her ideas right now. Cause they're like, well, you know, this last series, it didn't do well. So, um, you know, no, that's probably not gonna be a good. And so she's concerned because where does she go with her career now? And you can go to pub self publishing, uh, which she doesn't really want to do, but cause she is one who has always made more money in traditional publishing than self publishing. Um, for the record, I am trying to convince her to invest in the self publishing. She's dabbled, but if you dabble, I think you don't get nearly the return as if you really commit to it. And I've discovered that for myself this year, I've proved it to myself. So. The other thing about getting a nice healthy advance is that the publisher is out that money ahead of time. And so they put much more effort into selling the books. And I know it seems counterintuitive, but publishers do not always put effort into selling books. Um, <laughs> it's mystifying to all of us, you know, especially for, you know, like the, the third book in a trilogy, if the trilogy hasn't been selling all that well, um, it's happened to me. It's happened to so many of my friends, the publisher will essentially punt. They will yes, put the book out there, but they'll just put no effort behind it. They won't promote it. They sometimes they won't even distribute it. Um, I've had friends who have had books that were essentially abandoned. Like they never made it to the bookstore shelves because the publisher just decides, eh, this book isn't going to sell. So I'm not going to put any effort into it. You know, you would think because they already put the money into publishing it that they would want to sell copies, but they actually don't. It's, it's a weird business people. It's just a weird business. 
So that is part of the incentive to sell more books and grow your audience. Uh, because otherwise maybe it goes back to the growing and dying. They think that if you are not growing that you are dying and they're going to cut their losses and they're not going to invest in you anymore. So, so that's part of all of that. And there's my 20 minutes and I'm running behind today. So I will discuss more tomorrow. I do have other things to talk about and, um, but thank you all for your feedback. It's been, it's been an interesting conversation and I, um, Brett thinking about that S curve stuff and I'm going to incorporate that somehow. So I will remind you all that first cup of coffee, manual typewriter or not, is part of the frolic media podcast network. And you will find more podcasts that you love at frolic.media slash podcasts. And I will talk to you all tomorrow. Take care. Bye bye.